very good morning from Bali. It's 6.30 a.m. here right now. I just had a very beautiful uh, sunrise to watch while there were some uh, geckos climbing around the balcony. <laughs> it was really nice. Um, I'm happy to have you here and I'm also happy for everybody who uh, is going to watch the recording of this. Uh, today we're going to talk about a very important topic to me. It's about how to find your product market fit. And before I get started on uh, what we talk about today, about our agenda, um, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, who I am and why I might be qualified to talk about this to you today. Um, so my name is Victoria, quite obviously. And before I started my uh, own consultancy, I worked at a startup. I was a software startup and I worked there as a brand manager. And that startup, after nine years of existence, unfortunately failed quite dramatically because of a missing product market fit. So uh, it was very sad for all of us back then, but this is kind of the hustle, this is kind of the life you choose when you work in startups, right? Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So this startup didn't work, um, but ever since missing product market fit kind of became my enemy. Uh, and that's what I'm here to talk about today. So I'm the founder of the Phoenix Brand Consultancy. We have specialized in helping uh, women and non-binary founders to find a direction and clarity for their startups. And I have a bit of an unpopular belief that the key to a successful entrepreneurship is actually vulnerability. I don't think it makes us weak. I think when we face our fears, our fears of rejection, our fear of scarcity, our fear of abandonment, we actually become much stronger and we get what we need to persevere and uh, to strive actually in business. So this is where also the Phoenix comes in and lends some inspiration uh, for my company. Uh, I believe just like uh, the mythical Phoenix, brands need to sometimes set themselves on fire and uh, with that let go of everything that makes them weak, everything that makes them bland and cliche. And that's how they actually overcome obstacles. That's how they become stronger and re-emerge as a better and yeah, maybe more fabulous version of themselves. Uh, so. That's, uh, that's about Phoenix, that's about me. I'm really happy uh, to have you here today. And um, I would say, uh, let's get going, right? So what we're gonna talk about today, we're gonna start with how to survive as a startup. We're gonna go a little bit into uh, facts and uh, what it is that, uh, what is the reason why most startups fail and what can we actually learn from their mistakes? And we go into the framework uh, about product market fit. And I'm going to give you a bit of a comprehensive but short overview about uh, how to get started on research. And ultimately, we talk about finding your perfect match and uh, what that means. And I'm also going to have a very practical example so you see how to apply that framework I showed you earlier. All right, then without further ado, Let's get started in how to survive as a startup. When you look at those numbers, uh, they say that nine out of 10 startups fail. This is a Fortune uh, report from 2014. And it's quite a hard and bleak truth. Actually, nine out of 10 startups, that's, you know, most of them, right? And interestingly, uh, most of those failed startups are not at the very beginning. They're somewhere between years two and five. So this is normally when startups get ready um, to scale. This is when they get ready to pitch for Series A funding, right? This is when they think they're ready and just want to scale up. But instead of scaling up, it goes rapidly down. So it, it, the timing here is interesting. And then you also uh, dig a little bit deeper into the data and you find that according to the very same report, um, uh, the top reason that those startups think they fail is because they made products nobody wanted. So you see here that on the top here, 42% uh, of uh, founders identified the lack of market need as their single biggest reason for failure. And um, it's quite simple, right? If nobody is gonna go buy your product, um, you're not gonna make any money and therefore fail, right? But I'm wondering, right? That is the top reason for nine out of 10 startups to fail is not having a product market fit. So I'm curious, why do you think that is? Why does it happen that often, right? You think that by now it's, uh, it's very common sense um, you can also, you can unmute yourself or write in the chat. I'm curious what you think, right? Why do you think it happens that often? 
that companies fail because nobody wanted their product. Yeah, great. I think you you talked about some important things here, right? Something you said was missing differentiation, right? The consumer's not really knowing, yeah, I might be interested in this type of product, but why should I buy it from you? And also competition being tough, right? Uh, um, not being able to really differentiate, should I buy it from you or from you and what's really special about you? Yeah, completely yeah. agree. So from my personal experience, why does it happen so often? Why so often do startups fail because of missing product market fit is, uh, I do see um, there's often a technology first approach in startups. And it's something has to do that a lot of founders, they start their business because they had a spark, right? They had a curiosity about a product, about a functionality and think, oh, why has nobody ever thought of this before, right? Why has nobody done this before? And then they get really wrapped up in the nitty gritty of uh, producing that product, right? About the technology, right? Those are really smart people. Those are engineers, producers, right? And programmers. These are really, you know, people who are very detail oriented and then they get very detail oriented on the technology first. And think just because you know they like it and they're interested in that kind of technology, everybody else naturally is also interested in that. And another reason I find is that marketing is often seen as a bit of an afterthought, right? Oh, let's get the product out of the door. Let's do this. Let's build the MVP. Let's uh, let's put it out there. And at some point, right, maybe we hire somebody or maybe we can also just do it ourselves. We throw some money at it and then people will come naturally. And, and marketing there is like an afterthought and actually not the forethought of something. And uh, the last reason, and I think this isn't really talked a lot about is a fear of rejection. I think that as your own startup idea is a bit, you know, like your baby, you're super proud of it. You spend a lot of time there, right? In the nitty gritty of the details, dreaming it up, coming up with it. And then you're a little bit nervous about putting it out there, doing the research actually asking people, can you look at my MVP and tell me what you think, right? Because there is a likelihood, and especially in the very beginning, people are going to say, nah, I don't like it, or it is not useful for me, or this is what I not like, this is what I not like. And that hurts, right? Getting your feedback sometimes hurts, especially at an early stage. This is when you need the feedback the most. And instead of doing that, you know, work that can hurt sometimes, and receiving that feedback and criticism and helpful advice. Sometimes uh, founders decide not to do any research at all and just do it later on. People are going to love it anyway. All right. So what is product market fit then? According to that logic, product market fit is then making products people actually want. Right? Uh, it's, not, it's not that uh, very complicated. And I want to do a little bit of myth busting here, right? When people talk about a product market fit, I especially see that in accelerators and incubators, they treat it a little bit like the market is this like anonymous monolithic entity, right? Like you don't really know what it is, but the market is not, you know, anonymous. This is actually human beings that consist of the market, right? They're living, breathing beings with twists and turns and emotions. Sometimes they make sense, sometimes they don't make sense, right? It's real beings here and not just like the market, right? And in order to find product market fit, you really have to meet humans and their humanity to understand them. So what you find here is a bit of a, a modern version of the Maslow hierarchy of needs. And when you look into when we say um, fitting, right? Product, market, and fits. What is it actually in the middle there? The the want or the need or the vibes, right? It goes a little bit from the from the rational, the bottom here, right? Rational needs. You need food. You need uh, a roof over your head. You might need a car insurance. Then it goes into want, something you actually don't really need, but you kind of want, like going on vacation maybe. And this vibes even you know even more irrational than wants is something you it doesn't clearly not make any sense you know like buying a phone for over a thousand dollars it does not make any sense to do that but it's kind of vibing with you it satisfies an emotional need that you have it shows you something about yourself it gives you an identity you're craving so it's a bit of you know it's higher up so these are all the different ways you could meet uh, what people actually want and in order for a startup to succeed you kind of need to be 10 times better an improvement 10 times in some of this dimension for the customer. Otherwise, uh, they're not going to see you as any better. They're not going to adapt you, especially not in the early stage. 
All right, enough about uh, the numbers and what we're dealing with today. Let's dig a little bit deeper into the framework we're gonna work with today about product market fit. And if I had to pick only one graphic, only one image I, I'd show you about uh, what brand strategy actually is, I would choose this one. It is incredibly simple, but there's so much to learn here, so much to unpack and uh, so much uh, to take away from, from this graphic here. So you find that um, what you are actually after is in this graphic. It's called the three C's. It's company, customer, competition, and where those three overlap is your positioning. And positioning is kind of the holy grail of marketing. This is what we are all after. It gives us clarity about what we are, about who we are, about what we offer. It gives us direction of where we are now, of where we want to go. Uh, it is also very crucial for all kinds of pitch questions you're going to get. You know, when you, as soon as you are into you know, seed funding or Series A funding, investors going to ask you all questions like, why you? Why now? What's, what's special about you? What's different from you to the competitors? How are you planning to uh, attract uh, talent? Um, uh, what kind of customer segments are you after, right? All those questions can be answered once you solved out this puzzle here, this Venn diagram of the three Cs. So we go a little bit deeper into the three Cs. Um, on the, let's start on the bottom left. So positioning in the end is something that your company can authentically own and it's something that is really natural to you, right? It is not fake, right? That's kind of the opposite of authentically owning something, right? It is natural to your company because of lo your location, because of your heritage, your history, because of the talent you have, right? Because of what you have done before, people trust you, believe you, think it's credible that you own this. And you own it also uh, in the long term. You can defend it in the marketplace. Like this is yours and nobody else can have it. So this is like the bottom left. And your positioning also needs to be something that your ideal customers increasingly want. Uh, it does not help that there was a need for it in the past. There needs to be an increasing need in the future. And your positioning also needs to be something that you can deliver better or differently from the alternatives. Because you're never alone in the arena, right? You're never alone in the marketplace. There's always competition or alternatives. Um, uh, that fight for the same kind of attention for the same type of money of your ideal customer. And only when those three overlap and when you can say yes to all three of them, you actually have a positioning, you actually have something that every startup wants to survive. And uh, yeah, let's look a little bit deeper here. So you actually find that when you match what your brand can own with what your ideal customers want, this is when you find product market fit here. So on the, on the, when company and customer align, this is where you find product market fit. But you also see um, that finding product market fit is not enough for the perfect positioning. There's different players here too. Where customer and competition overlap, there's differentiation. And this is actually a topic we're gonna talk about next week. So stay tuned, uh, there's more to learn from there. And there's also a third piece uh, to that story. This is where company and competition overlap. This is company vision. Uh, this is uh, how you're actually gonna be able to attract top talent for your startup. So today the topic is product market fit, right? We talk about where company and customer perfectly align. But keep in mind when we talk about the framework and also the example later, this is only a slice of the cake. For positioning, we also need differentiation and company vision. And uh, to learn those, please uh, um, sign up for, uh, for the next events and we're gonna talk about the other two. And in the end, it's all gonna perfectly match up and align. All right, so for the topic of today, product market fit, like I said, it's where company and customer align and we find what I call the perfect match. And uh, it's actually an, an analogy that I'd like to use a little bit more often today, talking about dating is actually, I find very helpful uh, for this topic. I mean, I don't know, we probably all have some dating experience. It might be more in the past or it might be more recent, but we know how that feels like, right? Going into a, a date, wanting, wanting to find somebody who fits you perfectly. And something I wanna talk to you about too, is that often when people say product market fit, they think it's only about the market. 
right? Oh, we need have to find out what the market needs, how we can address them and go after that very like needy, right? Like, oh, just we give you whatever you want. But in reality, product market fit has to be the perfect balance of both, right? There's also you, there's you as a founder, there's your team, there's who you are as people, there's your core competencies you have at your company, there's the resource and the logistics and the location and your history, right? There's so much there on the company side to so don't ignore that. Oftentimes, um, founders treat their own company like, oh, and that can change, right? We can be anything. No, you can't be anything. There's something that's natural to you, and there's something that's already strong about you, and that will help you to find your perfect match. So it has to be uh, balanced on both sides. So on the left side, we have company, the company and what your brand can authentically own in the long term. And we have to ask questions here like, what is our greatest, greatest potential, right? Why do we exist at all? The day you came up with your startup idea, what actually drove you there? What was, what was there? What was the spark here? Then how do we overcome obstacles at a team? Um, what are our core cap competencies here? Um, what's our strategic location? Um, what's our access to resources and logistics? That's all part of the company side. On the other side, we have uh, customers and we ask who of those customers are our ideal customers? That could be revenue targets, but it could also be those type of customers it's most fun serving, or it's most uh, fun working with, right? Ideal customer can be, it's really subjective and it's up to your company what your ideal customer is. And then you ask, what is their life like? What are their wants, their needs, their frustrations? What drives them? Who are they right now? And who would they like to become in the future? And uh, what kind of alternatives are serving them right now? Who solves these problems or who helps them get to where they want right now and what's in there for them? So um, this is also where we can ask, for example, what are their devices? What kind of media do they use? Uh, on what channels do we find them? What kind of messages do they consume? So we try to understand as much as possible about our date. Uh, and about our ideal match here, uh, so we can actually fit really perfectly. And the perfect match in the end happens on two different levels. Like I said earlier, right, we are living, breathing human beings and uh, our decision making isn't always rational. I find that many founders treat uh, customers and the audience like they always make perfectly sense. Just because they have built a new feature and think, oh, but it is the best that feature that exists. And it's just the logical thing that everybody's going to adapt it because people are going to see it's the smartest and best feature. People don't work like that, right? We're very irrational sometimes. Our buying decisions, our purchase decisions, they're very irrational beings. So our perfect match has to match up on two different levels, right? There needs to be rational arguments about functionality, about how it's gonna uh, improve your life. For example, it's gonna save you money, it's gonna save you time, it's gonna give you comfort, right? There's gonna be some rational choices there, but there can also and should always be some emotional part of the matching part of it too. So um, it uh, makes me feel better about myself. I feel um, more popular with it, or I feel, um, I don't know, sexy with it, right? There's this emotional part to it too. And in the end, a perfect match, just like in the human world with two human beings, you gotta match your partner, not just on a rational, but also on an emotional part. And this is what we're gonna do. So rules for dating also apply here, interestingly. Um, the rule to first listen and then talk, for example. You go into the date and you listen first what your date, what your match actually uh, has to say. And then you you listen, you reflect on it, and then come up with something yourself, right? It's a more interesting kind of partnership, and it's a more interesting kind of date than just going in there and boasting about yourself. And uh, another rule is don't be fake. Don't show up to your first date like somebody you're not. Same counts here for, uh, for our matchmaking and product market. But don't show up as somebody you're not. Don't promise your ideal customer you're somebody you can't ever be. Um, know what you want. Go into the date knowing what you're searching for, like, this is me, uh, this is the kind of match I'm looking for, for my life, right? And as a company also know who you want to attract and what you actually want. Then don't be needy. Don't be like, oh, I can be anything you want. Just tell me what you need. I'll be anything to you, right? That's not very attractive. Would you date somebody like that who says I can be anything to you? 
Probably not, right? Also on the company side, you need to be very uh, secure, very confident about who you are and what you want. But also if you flip those relationship dynamics, you also don't want to be arrogant. You don't want to be the person who goes into that date and says, oh, I'm only after the hottest date in town. Everybody's after them. I'm also going to be after them, right? You can treat customers the same way. Everybody, you're all your competitors after that are after that one date. And everybody thinks they're the hottest date in town, right? The, the one customer segment everybody's after. And you find there's a lot of competition there. And uh, when there's a lot of competition, your hot date, your ideal customer there, they might not really know why they should pick you. Right? I think it, there's a lot to learn here from, uh, from dating analogies and rules of dating that we can apply to product market fit that can help you actually understand right now for the company you're working for, the company you have in mind right now, right? When we talk about product market fit, take a moment to reflect on how you're doing on your relationship dynamics. Are you doing great? Are you having a balanced date? Do you listen to your date? Do you then react to it? Are you needy? Are you maybe arrogant? How do you show up there? Do you even know who you are and what you're after? Right? It's a, I feel like it's a very helpful check-in uh, when you think about your company and uh, how you're doing. All right, so before we can answer any of these questions regarding the perfect match, we need to first get started on research. Right? There's a lot to uncover. There's a lot to discover about the company side and about the customer side before we can answer any of these questions. I'm gonna try to give you the most comprehensive overview about how to uh, actually get started on research for every budget. And I know depending on where you are with your startup and what kind of business you're working for, there's probably in the beginning, uh, not a lot of money to spend on marketing, but luckily there's a lot of free resources you can use to get started on research. All right, first of all, order of operations. This is how we do it. We start with objectives. We start with what do we actually want to find out. Then we go into desk research. Desk research pretty much means secondary data analysis. This is anything you can find out without talking to anybody. This is data that exists and everybody can potentially have access to. Then you do a qualitative research. This is a more open-ended discovery style type of research where you try to get as much input that you haven't thought about before. And then you test the hypothesis you get from qualitative research with quantitative research and see if it actually holds true about what you think uh, you know. So when we start with objectives and product market fit, we already have a good guideline for um, what we actually want to find out, right? We have the two sides of our perfect match and uh, these are our guiding questions. So we want to find out what associations can our brand authentically own? And with associations, again, we mean rational things, right? This could be functional benefits, but we also mean emotional benefits. And these could be adjectives. This could be, you know, like fast or saves me money. It could also be cool, chic, modern, trendy. It could also be slow, laggy, kind of out of date, right? There's, there's what you find in your research, you will find associations uh, that are negative. And these are also really important. Of course, when we do then positioning and intended brand image, you try to get away from the negative associations. But during your research, you're also going to uncover and also your intention to uncover negative associations that exist and be aware of them. And uh, we also want to find out what do our ideal customers increasingly want? Again, these are also associations on a rational and emotional level. And we want to find out, is this actually something they're after? Is this something that helps them in their life? Is this something they're frustrated about? Is this something they had positive experiences with or negative experiences with? Is this something they can think using in the future? This is what we find out. In the end, we can do the matchmaking. Then, after we've done our objectives, we can put a check mark on that one. We go into desk research. And this one, I have good news for you, is pretty much for free, right? There's always your resource, resources you can use uh, uh, to add to and pay for. Um, you can actually just buy a market segmentation uh, at a research company and you've pretty much done your job. That would be amazing, right? Uh, but if you don't, then you go ahead and find as much data as possible. And uh, I would always start with finding data on the category. So for example, your category, category could be um, 
um, uh, shoes or your category could be painkillers right? trying to find out like the overarching category of your know, where your product is what you in which field you're playing and find as much data as you can about how this category has evolved over time has it exist how far how long has it exists who are the biggest player in this category what are the trends what has happened in the past what is likely going to happen in the future if there's no data on your category and find a category that is similar to you and if you if you, if there's a really new and emerging market try to find an analogy something that has reacted like this in the past and see how it reacted there you can find this kind of data um, statista this is my my preference where i normally go to it is not entirely for free but it's pretty cheap uh, and you can find uh, a huge uh, a huge amount of resources there that will help you with statistically relevant data about um, uh, international markets and how they consist of. And you will also be able to find data on Google Scholar. It's also for free and you will find all, most of uh, academic research there. And just, you know, go into scholar.google.com and type in the category you're looking for. Maybe search for trends or developments and see what can you learn from academia? How is this field evolving? Where is this going? Then you can go into Google Trends and Google Keyword Analysis. This is a super helpful tool. If you've never used Google Trends before, it's quite mind blowing. You find out a lot about the demand side of things. How often do people search for example for the category, but also for your brand? How often do people search for uh, your competitor brand terms? And then you get a bit of an interesting idea about, oh yeah, so this is how it has been in 2017. And then they had a huge spike and now it's going back up. And you see like get an interesting idea about what is the demand side of things. The same thing happens when you analyze keywords with Google Analytics. And there's also a bunch of uh, SEO tools, SEO tools you can use to find out how often do people search for this and uh, what are actually the competitor keywords to get a bit of an understanding about the market dynamics here. Supply and demand interest uh, for a specific term and for a specific category. Then you can look into Facebook audience insights. It's a Facebook tool. It's a little creepy to be honest, but it's actually quite helpful and gives you a lot of interesting information. Um, just type in Facebook audience inside. You will get uh, with your business account into um, uh, an overview and into your eye where you can type in some demographic data, for example, uh, United States, uh, East Coast, an age range, uh, gender, and then you get all kinds of information about what those people are interested in, uh, what companies they follow, what their hobbies are, where they work, what their income bracket is. Even I think in the US, you can even see what they vote for. I know it's a little creepy, but it gives you a little bit of an understanding about um, what the demographic situation and also the psychographic situation of your ideal customers might be. And then ultimately, what I also really love to do is look, looking for press mentions, looking for uh, the about page, social media um, posts, and take some screen grabs of yours and your competitors and everybody else in the market that's important to you. Take some screen grabs and then circle words that are recurring like, oh, OK, this is coming up a lot. This is coming out a lot. Instead, our competitors, this is coming up a lot, right? There's a lot you can find in written word about how you present yourself and how others talk about you. That's also really interesting for you. So in the end, desk research is a little messy, but uh, you can put your nerdy glasses on and uh, do it for a couple of weeks. It's going to be really interesting. So you collect all that data, you write post-it notes with the most important insights and start putting them on walls. And that's when we actually start talking to people. We go into qualitative research. And like I said before, qualitative research is always open ended. Don't assume you know everything about your company, but also don't assume you know everything about your customers. This is one of the most common fallacies in the startup life, thinking you know the customer. I have news for you. You are not the customer just because you like it and fits you and it's your personal opinion. You'd be so surprised what happens when you actually pick up a phone and talk to them and like, wow, I was way off. Uh, so it's really important to not be leading with your questions. So you ask, um, for example, an open ended question would be um, when you think about your workday, what is your favorite part of it and why? You know, this is like a very 
you have no idea where this is going to go and it really depends on your uh, your the person you're interviewing what is going to come out of that type of question so you do these open-ended semi-structures interviews on internally you start with the founders you can also talk to stakeholders important partners of your company um maybe a lower management level and uh, ask them uh, all kinds of questions in about like 45 minute one hour longer conversational type interview and you also talk to your customers these could be your existing customers these could be loyalists people who really love you from the very first day there's a lot to learn about there it could be if you're not on the market yet it could also be potential customers right people you think according to your desk research these could make great customers for you in the future and you call them up and say hey i would really value your opinion here i really want to know a little bit more about who you are and what you need you'd be surprised how many times people say yes to that they're really they're really happy to actually share their thoughts to share their beliefs like oh finally somebody asking me this uh, and i can tell you everything i need so uh, that's my experience here so plan about 45 to uh, minutes to one hour and um, you can record this on a video call you can do it live in person record it with your phone make some notes uh, while you do it i've also done anonymous chats in the past that also worked um, and just try to be as conversational as possible. Qualitative research is never an email. It's never a forum. It's never a survey. You have to have that option to ask why or say, oh, that's interesting. Can you let, tell me a little bit more about it? The interesting stuff comes up when you dig deeper and you can only do that in a conversational type of situation and not in a forum. So during this discovery phase, you find out there's a lot you have never thought about before. You come up with some hypothesis, you see some, some overlaps, but oh, this keeps coming up, this keeps coming up. There's something interesting here. So you form up a hypothesis about who you are and also what they want, and then you test those in quantitative research. This is where we actually, these are closed ended questions. These are, for example, yes or no, multiple choice questions, sliders. This is where you test, do your assumptions actually uh, hold true that you have, that you have found there in qualitative research? Is it actually true what you think? And ideally you get um, a representative sample I know it's not uh, super easy to get a representative sample, but if you pay, for example, YouGov or a SurveyMonkey for, for a couple thousand dollars, you will get a representative sample of your customer segment. And that kind of data is invaluable. Imagine going into a Series A pitch or even a Series B pitch and you go in there and say, actually, we have representative data for all the assumptions we had and we have tested this and this is what we found out on a significant level. Imagine what kind of confidence this gives you uh, building your product and also asking for, uh, for money, having that kind of data. So I highly encourage you to spend that money if you have it. And if you don't want to spend it, there's also ways to get um, customer insights. It might even be a smaller, um, a smaller sample, but still, still better than nothing, right? Don't get me wrong here, right? I'm showing you a little bit of a, the perfect, the perfect recipe here. But if you only do like three of the things I showed you, you're doing better than 90% of other startups. They're not doing any of this. So try your best to get there. So quantitative research, we both we again do on two sides, right? We do the internal part. We talk to our employees and we do a, a survey with them. And we do also do it externally with customers and find out, is it true what we actually believe? For your internal survey, you can use Google Forms, Type Form, or again, SurveyMonkey. These are completely for free as long as you don't have to, as long as you don't hire um, um, participants. These are all for free and really easy to use and to analyze for quantitative data. And after you get all that data back, you test, oh, our, is our hypothesis true? What we believed, is it more towards yes? Is it more towards no? And you take all those learnings, every single thing people said. And again, you write a bunch of post-its and put them on the wall and try to find patterns. This is then where strategy comes in. This is uh, with quantitative research. It's the end of the diagnosis stage of the research stage of your project. Then this is when the magic happens. This is where strategy then ultimately begins. So this is the research part. And uh, now let's go into finding our perfect match. And in order to make this a little bit more entertaining, a little bit more interesting to you, I invented a company. 
So this is not real. So don't sue me for trademark. And if it doesn't make sense, it's probably because I made it up. So uh, meet Christina. Christina B is the founder of Scooty. It's an electric scooter company. Uh, she's actually from Southern Germany. It's a beautiful place close to, I'm from Southern Germany. <laughs> I like it's a beautiful place uh, and surrounded by mountains and forests. Um, it's quite it's quite a beautiful place to be. It's a bit rural though. Um, and people tend to be a little bit more conservative sometimes uh, and a little bit more comfortable, let's say. And uh, Christina, um, works in uh, southern Germany and used to work actually at a rubber company, a Germany's biggest supplier of rubber wheels. I completely made this up, right? Maybe, maybe it doesn't make any sense. And there at the rubber wheel factory, she met her future um, head of product and they both decided over lunch, man, we have so many of these uh, small rubber wheels. You know what we could do with them? Everybody's making e-scooters nowadays. You know what? We should make e-scooters too. We get such a uh, cheap supply here and obviously there's demand out there. So let's become another e-scooter company. And they called it Scooty and uh, they went out and uh, quit their day jobs and it became, uh, yeah, it became the backbone of the Scooty company. And they have existed for about two years. They uh, actually launched an MVP and their slogan is Scooty, the safe and fun way to commute. This is kind of the way uh, they positioned themselves in the beginning, like thinking that, you know, safety is probably a thing people are interested in, right? And people commute to work a lot, especially when they live in rural parts on the countryside, they need to commute to the cities. So how about they take our Scooty uh, uh, to work? And this is what they set out to do. And it worked pretty well for the first two years. They got some good seed investment because investors thought, wow, this is really a great supply chain you have there. Um, really cheap to produce. We haven't seen that in Germany yet. And they got some money there. But uh, after two years, they realized, hmm, actually, it's not picking up. We, we, don't really see, um, we don't really see a lot of revenue here. Um, our customers are not really that excited about Scooty. We don't really see a, a lot of adaption there. It's not going as fast as we think it would be. Something's off. We feel like we have not found our perfect match here. And um, uh, that's uh, something really helpful. So this is uh, a matrix uh, Christina uh, then looked at and uh, to find out um, where is, is her Scooty right now? What are the problems? So when you look in this matrix from left to right, you find customer relevance. So um, is it something that customers increasingly want? Uh, rather yes or rather no. And from top to bottom uh, or from bottom to top, you have company ownability. Is it something your brand, your company can authentically own in the long term? Rather, rather no to rather yes. And of course, the, the, our goal is to be at the upper right quadrant it's to be the perfect match of like yes customers increasingly wanted and yes we can definitely own this it's very authentic to us and we can defend it in the future you want to be at the perfect match the pure opposite of this is of course the dead product is where no customer relevance and no company ownability when you do have um when you when you can own it Right? When it's really authentic to you, when you can own it, when you have all the resources, you have the competencies, it's natural to you. Uh, then, and, but customers don't want it. Nobody wants it. Then what uh, we have something I like to call the CEO toy. It's a bit of a glorified sexy tool that the CEO internal people are really excited about, but nobody else is excited about. On the other hand side, when you have a high customer relevance, so people actually want that type of product, they actually need it. There's an increasing uh, increasing need for it, but it's not really authentic for you to own it. But it's really far away from what you're naturally good at. And it's really not very credible to you. And it's something that you can't really own yet uh, because also there's a lot of competition there and they're much better at it. This is when you have a weak product. This is also not where you want to be, right? This is also really, really close uh, to, to dying here as a company. So ideally, you want to be at the perfect match, and we have to find out where we are. So once uh, Christina, for our um, imaginary Scooty company, she, did, uh, she started off with objectives. 
she's done the desk research uh, and she went into she went into qualitative research and looked already at what she found and looked at this matrix and said okay i think right now um, I think we can own these wheels. Uh, we have really good logistics here. It's very natural to us. We have a good um, uh, location here in Southern Germany, the rubber wheel factory, that's something we can own. Um, but actually people don't really want it. So she said, we're somewhere between a dead product and the glorified CEO toy and she's like, shit. So now it makes sense. Now I understand like why we have we have not really found our product market fit, why things aren't going so well for us currently. And sorry, I wanna skip that for later. Um, so what she then does, she goes into, I'm oh not sorry. I'm gonna I'm gonna stay here. Uh, she went into uh, an exercise I call narrow your focus. And it's uh, it's of course it's just an uh, it's just these numbers you find here from a broad focus seven billion people. This is the macro perspective, right? The big picture, all people in this world. And when you go into a narrowing, you focus smaller and smaller and smaller. With the powers of ten, you get to one single person. And this is just a metaphor to use, right? Don't take those numbers too seriously, but it's just a metaphor to use. Like, who are you addressing right now? What is your what is your addressable market? And are you being too broad? This is normally what comes out of this exercise is finding out you have gone too broad. So after desk research, after the market segmentation, Christina then looks at her data and says, okay, we used to target for the first two years. Our marketing said something like, we are actually for everyone and uh, found out that her, um, her targeting was all Germans was pretty broad. It wasn't very, it wasn't very concise. Uh, it wasn't uh, very good to handle. So she's like, okay, probably we're, we're being a bit too broad here. And then she said, okay, let's narrow it down. Let's do all Southern Germans, for example. Let's filter it, right? What you do when you, when you niche down, you put a filter in it. Like when you search for a hotel and you put another filter and you get less search results. This is a little bit, you know, similar how, to how this works. And okay, so she said, let's let's filter it by location. So then let's uh, let's niche down and do all southern Germans. This is strategic to our location. This is where we come from. This is very authentic to us. And also southern Germany, it's a very profitable market. We've seen a lot of people use, uh, move to the countryside ever since the pandemic started. People want to go to nature a lot more. It's booming. Families move here. There's a lot of money and there's a lot of potential in southern Germany, rural regions. And said, okay, but maybe it's it's still a pretty broad, right? There's still a lot of competition there, and it's still not very precise for us to find a perfect match. And then she actually found in the data, um, there was an adoption curve by age. Uh, the question was, uh, have you ever tried an e-scooter before? And then it was um, split into age groups. And they found something interesting that it drops at the age of 30. Uh, so young people, teenagers, students, they have all tried and used e-scooters before, but the numbers significantly drop at the age of 30. And she thought, Christina Sharp, she was like, huh, so there's an opportunity for us here, right? So e-scooters could be something for all Southern Germans over 30. And this is where she um, said, okay, let's, let's stop right here. Let's get some uh, Southern Germans over 30 and do some qualitative research with them. And she went into the research, found some interesting things, went into quantitative research, and uh, then she had like a million post-its on the wall and she thought, okay, now let's begin the matchmaking. And I have her post-its here for you. In reality, this is a lot messier, I have to tell you. Uh, I only have, I have a wall at home and that is, is called uh, the post-it wall and it's just full of those uh, insights that and most of them are inconclusive. You will have 90% of posters on your wall. You won't really be able to do anything with them. And that's okay. So what you see here, I'm already leading you somewhere. And this is a lot easier than reality, but it helps you understand the concept and helps you understand uh, the framework better. So after Christina's uh, research for her Scooty company, what did she find out on the company side? So on the company side, she found out um, what really drives her company is a love for nature. It's something that she personally has a lot, but she also found the backbone of her company, her employees, they're really outdoorsy kind of people. They really love uh, where they live. There's a lot of pride for their region. 
they love the mountains and the forest and they think it's the best place to be and the best place to live. So that's something that's really ingrained in the company and that's part of them. They have also found that um, the founders particularly, but also the engineering team, they're very driven by technology. They're not super emotional kind of people. They're really nitty gritty. They're very detail oriented. They really want to make it perfect. This is a bit, uh, she also found in her research, a bit of a no German thing that holds true here. Very detail oriented. Perfection is always more important uh, than getting it out there quick. So everything has to be just perfect for them. So that's for some interesting insights she found here on the company side. On the other side for our perfect match or ideal match, what else has she found out during her desk research, her qualitative and quantitative research. She found out that people actually take the car to commute to work. And most people who work in you know, the rural areas, they have to take a car and drive uh, 30, 45 minutes into the bigger city to go to work. It has never occurred to them to take another type of vehicle but a car in that research, which was interesting uh, for Christina and the Scooty company that actually positioned themselves as the e-scooter to commute to work. Said, oh no, the people take the car. No, now that everything makes sense. And she also found out in the research when she asked about you know, what they do on the weekends that those people really love to go on the mountain bike. They live in a very hilly region uh, of the country and really love by the weekend to put their little riding shorts on and go the mountain bike in uh, the mountains and the forest and uh, go on an adventure. Um, she also found out um, that um, the ideal customers, similarly to the company, they also really love nature. Right? They're very um, rooted in where they live. They also think that scooters are bad for the environment. A lot of people in the research said like, oh, we've seen people throw them in the river and it's really not good for forests. And where do those batteries come from? And also the rubber wheels, right? Are they environmentally friendly? It's something that is really important to the customers. She found out that when uh, she asked them about Scooty, nobody knew what Scooty was. They've never heard about it. So that's quite a sign for low brand recognition, low awareness. That wasn't really good, but it's still an insight. And also people said when they hear about Scooty and were presented with images, they said, oh, it sounds like it's for kids. It sounds like it's, you know, what those kids do after school. I've never even considered using one of those Scooties before. Um, what else was there? There was a finding that said that safety is actually not that important to those customers, which surprised Christina uh, profusely. She thought like, oh, safety, this must be super important to them. But actually, as long as the vehicle's fine, as long, you know, as long as the product has a good quality, um, being safe is not super important to them, seeing that they also have quite dangerous uh, sporting activities there on the weekend with the mountain bike. Um, and there's two more learnings she found. She also found that the older the customers were, uh, she interviewed, uh, and they really don't get the appeal of e-scooters. They really, they really don't understand what this is about and uh, why, why young kids actually use e-scooters. And she also found the last bit of insight found there was a skepticism towards American and Chinese brands. They said like all those e-scooter companies, everybody comes in here with their mobiles and from, they import them from China. They were really, yeah, rather conservative, skeptical about it and were not super hyped about it. So this is, so imagine you are now the brand strategist on this topic, or uh, imagine you are Christina or Christina's co-founder. How would you go about this? I'm curious. If you want, you can unmute yourself or write in the chat, anything goes. Where do you see overlap? When we do, uh, when we do find our perfect product market fit, what aligns on both sides? Where would you see this, this playing out? Curious quite easily. So when you match a company and customer site here for Scooty, you find there are some perfect matches on the rational and on the emotional side for her company. On the rational side, she found that uh, being made in Germany and that high quality signifier that it means to be made in Germany is something that perfectly matches. 
it matches uh, with uh, what her company is, what the vision is, what the core competencies are, what kind of people work there, the strategic location, and also with what the customers actually want. Made in Germany is like a perfect match on the rational side for them. And it also means like the steel production, the rubber production, it's just gonna be a higher quality type of e-scooter when you compare it to uh, the competition. And also on the emotional side, she found some matches here. She found that outdoor adventure is actually a perfect match between those two. Uh, the love for nature uh, is something that's ingrained in her company. And they're also very, you know, adventurous type of people. And it's also something that perfectly matches her, her customers. This is actually what they're seeking on the weekends, what they actually want for fun. They need outdoor adventure. They don't want to sit in a car actually. And interestingly, the last bit of emotional uh, overlap here was function, uh, fun over function. And it surprised her too. That's the one she was uh, least expecting. She thought like, oh, it always has to be super functional, right? And they have to go to commute over it. But the, her learning was, and this is where she also found her interesting piece for the product market fit is actually if she markets it for fun, and not for the function for the commute, this actually fits the people much better. This is what they want. And this is also uh, what we can offer. And this is kind of where she left off her research here for product market fit. Because as I've showed you earlier, this is not the end of the story. This is, this is super conclusive and extremely helpful. And like I said, more than 90% of startups will ever do to find their product market fit, but it's not enough. For positioning. For positioning, you will also have to defend what you have found here in the marketplace. You have to defend it uh, from the competition. And this is interesting. And there will be a sequel about Christina and the Scooty company and what will come out after this. So um, I invite you all. I'm going to send if you're interested about this. So we're going to talk about this uh, next week about how to differentiate your startup from the competition. And then the week after that, we're going to talk about how to find your company vision that attracts clients.